Well, my name is Audrey Goodfriend, and I live in Berkeley, California, but grew up in New York City, but have been in California much more than two-thirds of my life. Uh, and how I got to be born is one of my favorite stories. And and I, I love to tell this especially to anarchists because I, the name of the story is I am born because of an agent provocateur. <laughs> so I think that's, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> okay how my mother and father met. So I tell you about my father and I have to tell you about my mother, right? That's yeah. how. <laughs> and my father uh, had become a Jewish socialist in Warsaw, Poland as a very young man. He was working as an, an apprentice and it was a big working class movement there, Yiddish Bund. And he was protesting at a May Day parade before World War I, like 1912 or 13. And uh, Poland belonged to Russia at the time. And they were all, all these kids were arrested. And the family, poor and very orthodox religious, was really worried that he would be drafted or sent, sent away to Siberia or put in jail and sent to Siberia. They decided they better raise some funds and get him to come to the United States, which they did. I don't know how they raised the funds. I never got that from my father. And I don't know what boat he came on, but I know he came on a boat and was below deck for a long, long time, arrived in Baltimore and was going to his uncle, his mother's brother, who was, had come earlier and was living in Chicago. So he was going to his uncle in Chicago. He was known as Dead Uncle. And uh, he said he didn't, you know, he, Baltimore at that time was, the harbor was a really, really awful place. He couldn't believe how awful this golden land was post was looking when they had such different visions of what America was like. Warsaw was a beautiful city with parks and trees and everything else. And here he kind of came to essentially an area that was slum. But he got to Chicago and and got a job as a, his trade was bookbinding. He got a job as a bookbinder in a factory in Chicago and met a man who was a an anarchist and introduced him to the Freyablishtimme. And, and they had discussions about socialism versus anarchism, and my father became an anarchist. Also went to school and was learning English, and had learned English. And then there was an international young people's anarchist group in Chicago that my father was part of. And this was a time that Emma Goldman was really, really active in the United States, going around trying to get people to protest the draft, if not be drafted and anti-war, and she was locked up lots of time. At that time in the United States, any young man was stopped on the street, and if he hadn't registered for the draft, he was they were sent to jail. My father, fortunately enough, was not old enough factually to be 18, because again, the Orthodox Jews in Europe didn't want their children to go into the army, and they didn't register them until they were a couple of years old what they were able to do. So my father's official papers had him younger. So he was able to be in the streets and hand out leaflets and do things and not be arrested. And he was part of, yet part of this group that was trying to evade the law, just because some of them were young and would have been drafted. Uh, uh, but uh, amongst them, a uh, the person he was living with, sharing a, a room with, not an apartment, just sharing a room, another who was part of this group. And this group was not involved in, in direct action and bomb throwing. They were in they were, at, they were not doing anything that Chicago is known for, like a hay market, right? They were not doing anything like that. But this man, whose name now I don't remember, my father, was trying to incite everybody to do something, like throw a bomb or shoot somebody up or something. And then they discovered that he had been planted as an Asian provocateur. And he is now my father's roommate. And this really frightened my father. And he said, oh, God, I better get away, because who knows what they've got on me, you know. And uh, he packed up, and he came to New York City. And they knew, in New York City, meanwhile, there was a, pl a place, a boarding uh, place in Harlem, where a woman who had children, she had been in, in Stelton with her young children. She and the man, father had split up, and she had to 
make a living for her family. And she moved to New York City and rented a big, big house where young anarchist men and women who were working and needed a place to live and someone to cook for them because all of them were immigrants. And so Ida had this place in Harlem and my father moved there. It was a place for him. My mother, okay, my, so my father's living there. My mother <laughs> was raised also by a very, very, very orthodox mother. Didn't, Jewish women didn't have to learn how to read and write. They just had to say the prayers and, you know, do the, memorize them. And my mother was an apprentice uh, garment worker. They would teach, she was learning how to become a, a seamstress. Uh, at that time in Russia, Poland, young Yiddish woman, women whose parents were able to send them to school, so many of them became radicalized and became socialists. And what they would do is they would try to organize, proselytize Jewish women, men and women, or in the in the little towns, with the shtetl, known as the shtetl, organize them, and so. Some young women came to my mother's hometown, which was Tedespol, and uh, got a few women together, and they were doing totally, un it was illegal, again, this was totally illegal. They had to take them, my mother says, into the forest. They, these young women go into the forest and they learn how to read and write, and they learned about, also about socialism and czar, and you know, in, and so my mother was radicalized and kicked religion. Uh, and she found it really, really hard to live with her mother. Her father had been dead since she was a baby back. So, but her mother was kind of, and she was the youngest child. And uh, she found it just impossible to live with her mother. So meanwhile, this woman, Ida, was from her town, from her hometown, who was running the... So she, she came to Ida. At this time, Ida was still living in New Jersey with her family. That's where my mother came to Ida's house and knew Ida. And then Ida and my mother's living in Newark because they were living in Newark, New Jersey. My mother. Then when Ida moves to New York, my mother moves also into this house. And she gets, she's working in New York and she also needs a place to live. So my mother and father and other men and women, young men and women are living in this house. There are about eight people besides Ida and her children living there. And the Spanish flu, this was not post-World War, the war has ended now, it's right at the end of World War II. And, I'm sorry, World War I. <laughs> World War I. <laughs> and and uh, the war has ended and uh, the Spanish flu is taking over a lot of people are sick. And my mother comes home from work one day and every they, the men and women all, all ate together because I just cooked for a bunch of people and they said and the interesting thing is that all the Jewish anarchists that I knew this is a little aside all the men were called by their last names and the women were called by their first names so my father was always called by his last name which was good friends in Yiddish and and my any and other people like I had friends the last there was Karpov was the man, and the woman was Paula. Fleisel was the woman, and the wife was Fanny. I mean, it was just, I don't know why. I really, something I would sometimes like to know why that was among those people, but as it is. So my mother came home from work and said, Be as good, where is good friend? Because they, they spoke Yiddish. Where is good friend? Be his good friend. They said, oh, he came home and he wasn't feeling well somehow. And my mother went up to his room because apparently she had her eyes on him all along. They were not coupled, but she had her eyes on him. And she went up there and he was very, very sick and she kind of took care of him. She nursed him. And then, uh, I don't know how many months after this situation, <laughs> I was the result. <laughs> so, I mean, if there hadn't been an agent provocateur, I would not have been born. My father would have remained in Chicago, and not, you know, she, he would not have met my mother. So, and anyway, here I am. <laughs> here I am. And I'm beware of Asian provocateurs. <laughs>
well, it was originally called the Ferrer Center, named after Francisco Ferrer, and then when Rocker, Rudolf Rocker died, it was called the Rocco Ferrer. And all, you know, all the members were anarchists, and they, you know, even though we lived very crowded in a very small apartment, when anybody was over, you know, they were always discussing politics, and, and you know, very, very early heard the fact of, of oh, and, you know, I just, also, I was a kid when the Sacco and Vanzetti days, Mm. You know, this is something I just remember, 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 and I was, I guess, six, I was six when they were electrocuted. No, they weren't, they were hung. I don't even remember now what they, what happened to them. Sacco and Vanzetti, were they shot, hung, or electrocuted? They were hung, wounded. I don't remember. Yeah. But I can remember the day, I can remember the day that that happened, and I remember my, you know, my parents reading to me in the paper, and reading the letter that Sacco had left for his son. And, and you know, I can remember just crying, crying, crying. But even, you know, before that, all the demonstrations I was taken to, you know. So, I mean, I was aware of what was going on very, very early. So I guess, yeah. So, I mean, so there was a milieu of anarchist talk always, in, you know, in the house. And people who came, they were always discussing what the Bolsheviks were doing. And then, then where I lived, so where I lived was, uh, it was called the Shalom Aleichem houses, which at that time was started by secular, radical Jews who wanted to perpetuate Yiddish language and culture. And they were the whole gamut of leftism from communists all the way through the various kind of socialists, Trotskyites, Anarchists, even like Paulo Zionists, probably, which were a form of a Marxist Zionist form, and and they were always so pe in the house people wherever you went people were discussing politics, so there was politics was in the air. I mean, we kids when we played, we played capitalists and workers, <laughs> not not cowboys and Indians. Mm -hmm. So you know this was this was the milieu. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I was always involved in, in hearing about anarchism. And as I, one of the things I said at that speech is, I, there were several Yiddish anarchist poets, and one a Yiddish poet whose name was Yiddish was Bofsheva. Basav Bofsheva was his name. And I don't remember the whole poem anymore, but my parents would always have me recite it, and it was a a belt on hersha. It was called anarchia. This is an this is anarchia. A land on hersha and un a land without who would not who would who is not being governed and weren't governing. I mean, people who weren't governing and don't govern a lot. Anyway, so I mean, I, I, this was a little kid. I was reciting these things like four years old, right? Mm -hmm. I get up on a chair, and I can remember that actually. Get up. I mean, was I was not shy. <laughs> I get up in the chair and do that. Whereas my my sister was one eight years after me was very shy. All right, that's beside the point. So, can you maybe tell us a bit about Freie Arbeiterstimme? Your parents were involved in that. Yeah, the Freie Arbeiterstimme. We got we got it was a weekly. Came out every week, at that and 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 uh, my father was. And it was put out by a group, by Jewish anarchists, and there were Yiddish groups all around the United States that kind of supported it. Have you ever seen a copy of the paper? Mm. I, I have some, I have one or two stuck away. Oh, I will, great. If you want to stop and I can get it, find, I think I can find it and show it to you, but I can do it later on too. Okay. Okay. Um, and so they, they read that, and there were always events, and there were lectures. Rudolf Rocker, oh, that's a name you might know, okay. So he, he had come to the United States, sometimes he, at that time he came, actually the first time he came he hadn't emigrated here yet, because I can remember uh, as a little kid when he, uh, he came and I was like four years old and I can remember there was a big picnic and he was, he was there and he was speaking, and he, and he spoke Yiddish. And so he, he, anyway those early years later on he would come once a year and uh, the evening before Yom, K Yom Kippur, the, he would speak, always give a lecture on, uh, on anarchism or something at, at the Shalom Lech. And that was, and that black was once a year, he was at least there once a year giving a lecture. And then there were always uh, 
they were always raising money. There was always some kind of affair for raising money. So there was all, it was a real cultural atmosphere for me. Uh, they'd have annual bazaars for a couple of days, which were I'm, a lot of fun. I can remember them being a lot of fun. You know, there was food and there was dancing and there was singing. And my parents always, you know, they, you know, there was just a lot of gathering of, and mostly raising funds. They were mostly raising funds for various things all the years that I can remember. Uh, and the paper had articles by, you know, all the, you know, they had things from Emma Goldman and they had things from August um, Suchi and they had things from Berkman. Yeah, these were, these people were all still alive and they were all writing. So there was, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of, and I would read, read all the stuff that, that was in the paper. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I don't know about how the federation functioned. I don't know exactly how that functioned. I know my father would go to a, a federatia, a federation meeting, you know, one, once a month. I know that. I can remember him. It was a Friday night. He, would, I mean, he was never home on Friday nights because he was at the federation meeting. And when I was a little kid, really. Uh, I don't know what else I can tell you about the federation. Hmm. And then, and you said there were lots of anarchists from all over, uh, all over Europe. There, like the Yiddish anarchists and Italian anarchists. But they were involved. Yeah, there were a lot of. Yeah, there was. There were a lot of anarchist papers being published. There was a Yiddish anarchist paper, the Feierabendstimme. There was Cultura Proletaria, which is a Spanish anarchist paper. In fact, later on, our group, when we published, when, when I left, the, when I. You know, well, when, when the van got folded and, and the other group where I, when I met my friend from Temple University and I got in touch with the Italian anarchists and by that time we were meeting together and uh, uh, you know and they, so anyway so they put out the La, La Donata de Repatati and there was Il Martello coming out and there was the Yellow Truda there was a Russian paper coming out Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of, and then when we came out to California, we met a group of, of uh, Chinese anarchists out here. They weren't publishing a paper, but there were a group of Chinese anarchists living in San Francisco that we met. They were speaking English, of course, but they were Chinese. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of, a lot of, and, and not much English. Uh, my parents got an English paper called The Road to Freedom when I was young, pu uh, published by Harry Kelly. And then later on, my parents got them, and you know, and I read. At that time, I was already reading that. And then a uh, man came out, published by Marcus Graham. In fact, that came out from from Oakland. I don't know. He was a cause celebre too, because they tried to deport him. They never could find where he lived, so he remained here until he died as an old man. And that was man. It was. I don't know if you've ever seen. I have a book that has some kind of has some of the reprints from man. If you want, to, you want me to show it to you now, I can show it to you now, otherwise you can remind me later. Yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> <me>. <laughs> okay. um, and then you have all this, I mean, you were 16, right, during the Spanish Revolution? Yeah, I, w when, you know, I was 16, 1936, I was, well, I w wasn't even quite 16 yet, because okay. my birthday is in the end of the year, I was born in 1920, so, uh, yeah, and, yeah, I was very excited about the Spanish Revolution, really, really excited by it. And, uh, and and that, like, did you have a lot of information about that? Like, well, at that time, then, yeah. Well, what ha was coming? An English paper came out then. Oh, see, then there was the Vanguard group had split because a lot. As I told some of the people, oh, there was a lot of splits. Not so much because of ideology, but personal. You know, somebody fell in love with somebody else's woman. And, you know, and they couldn't stand each other, and and, and there were a lot of that kind of separations going on. So the Vanguard split it at that time and and the Vanguard continued and I don't remember now the name of the other paper that can, that was published at the same time. I don't remember that name. But then during the Spanish Revolution time the two groups got back together again and published this, the Span a paper called the Spanish Revolution. Mm. And so then there were, you know, and then uh, uh, you know, people. Some people came from Spain, and there were lectures and 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 meetings. You know, to support the revolution. Because your parents were anarchists, did you ever?
question anarchism, or was that just... I question their anarchism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, question their anarchism, because, you know, they... They voted, you know, and they... Then, you know, then for Israel. Mm. And I, and you know, and I, I kind of, I can remember as, as a little kid saying, you know, there shouldn't be any bosses, and when they were tired of telling me to do something, I say, you're not my boss. I can remember as a kid saying that you're not my boss. <laughs> so no, I didn't, I didn't question anarchism, mm. you know, because I, I had read Emigo. I mean, I was convinced that I, that it was the right thing, because I really, I had read, I. When I was 11, I read the ABC of Anarchist Communism, Alexander Burton's, and you know, that was a simple, simple, simple explanation of what anarchism is all about. And, and you know, and I had hoped to see the revolution, and you know, I was hoping, you know, Spain was one of these things. But actually what happened to me since, and then I guess why I got involved in, in education, because is that I, I really began to feel that I'm not any special kind of anarchist, I'm just a, I'm an anarchist, and I really don't think that that uh, seeing what happened to the Spanish Revolution, first the Russian Revolution and then the Spanish Revolution, when the anarchists entered the government, and and, and you know, that unless unless like 90 percent of the, of the people are anarchists, but the result will not be an anarchist society in any way, and so I rescinded my notions of how I thought an anarchist world would be. And at one time I really thought how an anarchist world would be. You know, I had it all organized and federated and, you know, exactly how. And then I figured, I, I really don't know what kind of, I mean, it would have to be decided by the people who were there, whatever, if that ever happens, not by what I think should happen. And so uh, I got into, and I said, well, what? Well, a few of us in New York decided, what can we do as anarchists? You know, what, what? Is there a life for us? You know, none of us had lots of money. We all had to work, and at that time we decided, well, maybe the thing to do is to live cooperatively, communally, see how much how we can live out, outside the system you know, with how little we can do, and you know, spread our ideas that way. And uh, so David and I, man, I was living. Oh, this is another thing. When David and I lived together, my parents who were never married. Said, said, why don't I? Don't, why don't we get married? He said, my mom, you and Papa were never married. Why should we get married? They said, oh, things are different now. You know. Okay. Uh, an anarchist is a person who believes in being able to live with one's family and friends and neighbors without having having to work in a capitalist system without having to uh, have a, a government, police, armies, and uh, in, in the area where you live with your friends, you figure out how to live. Figure out how you want your kids to grow up, if you have kids, uh, and basically work things out peacefully. Not that there aren't differences, but if there are differences, you either leave your area, move someplace else, or you fight it out, hand to hand, person to person. But, mm -hmm. but not with it being a, an army or a police force. No, it is not. It's a misdefinition of, of anarchism. Anarchism is not chaos. Anarchism is a very, or as I said before, a very ordered working together with, with people. And it's not chaos and it's not violence. It's working out differences. Uh, chaos is not anarchism. Whoever said that is doesn't know what anarchism is, because anarchism basically just means without government. What do you think are the most important anarchist principles? The most important anarchist principles? Wow. Live and let live. I don't know if it's an anarchist principle, <laughs> but that's, that's my, one of my principles. Mutual aid, yes. Mutual aid is a very important one. I talk about mutual aid a lot. And that's one thing that's easy to talk with people who are not anarchists. 
Like that concept of mutual aid. Mm. Yeah. Uh, How would you explain? Not exploiting, not not taking it, well, not making money from somebody else's work. Even if not being a capitalist, but not making money from other people's work. Uh, I've never thought of anarchist principles. Hmm. In fact, you know, not being in author, not being an authoritarian, and not being under the heel of an authority. If you can, as much as you can, I guess I don't know. Again, I don't know. It's a principle, but it, being as illegal as you can get away with. <laughs> <laughs> the last question would be: What can each one of us do to make the world better today? And uh, you know, I, I believe in supporting as many newspapers as I can, whether I agree with them or I don't agree with them. So I mean, I get, I, you know, I get, I get everything. I get the fifth estate, and I get social anarchism, and I get anarcho-syndicalism. You know, I get all these things, and I read them all, and, and you know, contribute to their well-being somehow or other. Uh, my granddaughter has a friends who have just done a documentary, and I saw it about two weeks ago. And these are people who went all through Mexico and South America interviewing small communities here, there, and everywhere, and here were people doing marvelous things in their own communities, like planting trees, doing something about the pollution in the water near them. They were really not cities, they were not in big cities, in just little places. And, and there were lots, well, I saw at least six places that they had little documentaries from, and I, I found sheep. You know, that is really exciting for me.